So hi, everyone, and welcome. We'd like to welcome Jewel and Emmy with us this evening to talk about a rights-based approach to early learning and childcare. My name is Robin McMillan, and I'd like to welcome you from the Canadian Child Care Federation. I'm here with my colleague, Suzanne, and she's going to do a land acknowledgement for us. And don't forget to unmute, Suzanne. I can see that you're muted um, before you start. And what we're going to do is have our webinar and uh, I wanted to let you know that we'll be sending out the certificates after uh, within a week of the webinar. They'll be coming from from me in a separate email as well as a follow up email message. So certificates will be sent out to all of you who are participating in this live webinar tonight. So welcome again and over to you, Suzanne. Thank you, Robin. We respectfully acknowledge that the land on which the CCCF is located is the tra traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. We recognize all Indigenous people who were here before us, those who live with us now, and the seven generations to come. As Indigenous people have done since time immemorial, we strive to be responsible stewards of the land and to respect the cultures, ceremonies, and traditions of all who call it home. As we open our hearts and minds to the past, we commit ourselves to working in a spirit of truth and reconciliation to make a better future for all. Today, these lands continue to be shared territory and are occupied by many diverse peoples from near and far. A treaty is an inheritance a responsibility, and a relationship. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Awesome. Hey, Suzanne, <laughs> Thanks so much. Sorry about that. Um, yes, yeah, so we're going to turn it over to our expert hosts this evening, Emmy and Jewel. But I just wanted to let you know that they will be monitoring the questions in the chat. So they'll be participating with you that way. And certainly if there's any technical questions you have, be sure to put them in the um, in the questions or chats and we can address those as well. Because there's so many attendees, we've turned people off on mute. So just so you know, we're still monitoring those. But uh, if you have any concerns or questions, please put them in the in the chat. So welcome and over to you, Emmy and Jewel. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Thanks so much, Robin and Suzanne. Thanks for that. And thanks everyone for attending. Jewel and I are delighted to conduct this webinar for you in partnership with the Canadian Child Care Federation today. The webinar will be focusing on reviewing relevant articles within the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and their importance and relevance to early childhood education and the practice that we as ECEs take on. The webinar, as you might have seen in the description sent by CCCF, is going to cover things like meaningful participation, what does that mean, what does that look like, democratic processes, children's agency, as well as parent and caregiver education and advocacy as well. So we're going to um, explore and define a children's rights-based approach and provide some practical strategies and examples on how we can actually implement that approach in the early learning field. And so practical resources will be provided to you at the end of the session as well to integrate into your programs and your personal practices. So we're really excited to talk about this topic. Um, we're seeing a lot of you are joining from all over Canada. Um, but myself and Jewel do want to recognize that we are joining from Calgary. Um, so I'll do a land acknowledgement that's specific to us in Calgary. And so we're meeting today on the traditional territories of the Natitsipi Blackfoot and the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Siksika, the Pigani, the Ghana, the Sitina, and the Eahe Nakoda. So briefly, just to introduce who we are, um, my name is Emmy. I'm an instructor at Bow Valley College in Calgary, as well as Mount Royal University in Calgary in the Child Studies program. And so I, I teach about children's rights, of course, but I'm mostly a passionate advocate um, and researcher of children's rights. And I'm joined by Jewel May, a recent graduate of Mount Royal University, um, as you can see by her lovely picture, who now holds a Bachelor of Child Studies with a major in early learning. 
also a very passionate children's rights advocate. And so we're very excited to lead tonight's webinar and to talk about this important topic. Um, we have done some webinars before on specific pieces and articles of, about the UNCRC. So this evening, we just want to introduce what the Convention on the Rights of the Child is, what a child's rights-based approach to practice is, and some of those more general concepts for you. Awesome. So we want to start by asking um, who is familiar with the UNCRC? And so you'll see on your teams there you have a little reaction button. So maybe you can just do a quick kind of thumbs up emoji or a hands up um, if it's something you've heard of. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Lots of thumbs. That's awesome. Great. And we like to kind of start our webinars like this because we can note that if you're new to the convention and you've never heard of it, or if you're familiar with it, we are confident that you'll leave today with a more practical understanding of its applicability to specifically the early learning field, um, its relevancy, its importance, and our role as educators to uphold the UNCRC um, as those individuals who work alongside children. So despite your knowledge level, this webinar is designed to be helpful for everyone. And so we're going to start by discussing what is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, which I'll refer to, myself and Jewel will refer to as the UNCRC for short. Um, and so again, this might be a refresher for some of you, or it might be new information. Um, essentially, the UNCRC is a human rights treaty that was established by the United Nations in 1989. Canada as a country signed on to the convention in 1991. Virtually every country worldwide has ratified the convention, with the notable exception of the United States. And so the UNCRC is essentially a comprehensive set of rights for individuals from birth up to the age of 18. And so children are born with these rights, regardless of their gender, their culture, their geographical location, these types of considerations. These rights are afforded to children and youth from the moment that they're born. And so we like to think of these articles and these provisions as a sort of roadmap or a set of guidelines when it comes to working with children in a rights-based way, which we're going to spend more time talking about. So when we look at the child-friendly version of the UNCRC, which you can see here on the screen, um, and this will also be linked on your list of resources we'll, we'll send you off with this evening, um, these are the articles within the UNCRC. The full convention as a written document has much more description, and some of these categories have subcategories as well. So you can, of course, visit the actual UNCRC to look at some more of that specific language. Um, but the child-friendly version of the convention is a great place to start. So if you're new to the document, because it summarizes each of these rights, in relatively simple language, it's a great place to start making sense of these things. The first 42 articles, which you can see here, outline the entitlements for children. So these are the rights that children should learn about and know about because these are the rights that belong to them. They're relevant within their daily lives and their lives within early learning centers as well. And so then you'll see there kind of in the bottom right corner, articles 43 to 54, those represent how governments or policymakers, and even us as educators, can collaborate to ensure that these rights are upheld. One way that we can uphold these rights is through learning about and applying a children's rights-based approach to practice. So um, what is that? Essentially, a children's rights-based approach to framework, it's a framework that sorry, approach to practice is a framework that places the rights and best interests of children at the forefront of decision making, policy development, and program implementation. And so the approach is rooted in the principles that are outlined in documents like the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which we just briefly reviewed. It's about placing the UNCRC and the rights of children at the heart of planning, um, and service delivery, and integrating children's rights into every aspect of decision-making, policy, and practice. 
This approach is essential in promoting a nurturing, inclusive, and supportive environment that allows children to thrive and reach their full potential, which should be the goal of every ECE, really, or individual who works alongside children. And so the approach, a children's rights-based approach, emphasizes that children are not just passive recipients of care and protection, but they're active participants and agents in their own growth and development. And we'll talk a little bit about agency as well and what that means. This idea of a children's rights-based approach highlights that children are not human becomings, right? They're human beings in their own right with their own perspectives and thoughts. And so a children's rights-based approach respects and upholds this important notion. And so the approach itself consists of specific components and strategies that are worth unpacking. And so we're gonna take a closer look at these now. Um, Jewel's gonna review some of those. Thanks, Emmy. So some key pieces to consider when implementing or introducing a children's rights-based approach is first and foremost, this approach acknowledges that children are rights holders. It recognizes that every child, regardless of their age, their background, their abilities or circumstances, they all have equal access to these rights. So it involves making decisions and taking actions that prioritize the best interests of the children. So today we're going to touch on a few specific ways to do that. Again, we only have an hour, so we can't dive in, but the approach it a children's rights based approach. It also considers children and decisions that affect them. So by allowing them to express their views and opinions and uh, meaningfully participate. Um, another key component is it holds centers, organizations and individuals accountable for upholding respect for children and their rights. The approach involves providing children with the knowledge, the skills and opportunities to exercise their rights and become active participants in their own develop development and become citizens with agency. Uh, it also is about recognizing that children have physical, emotional and social cognitive needs that need to be met in order to support their development, which we all, all already know. But on a larger scale, it also involves ensuring that laws, policies and practices at all levels in the early learning profession are in line with children's rights and children's rights principles as outlined within the UNCRC. Uh, so this involves a lot of advocacy on our end, which we'll also talk about. Mm -hmm. So most importantly, we want to highlight before we get into some more of those strategies and specifics that a children's rights based approach is not about giving our rights away as adults or educators. And you can see this candle here, this candle lighting visual. This represents the idea that children's rights are not about giving away the flame or in this case, giving away the rights, but sharing and empowering through lighting the candle of the children and lighting the candle of their rights. And so it's not about letting children have all the control or all the power, um, but sharing and coordinating the power. It's not about doing whatever the children say. That's not a principle in children's rights um, or a children's rights based approach. As educators, it's our job to advocate for children's rights, to implement them into our daily practice and to consider these things as professionals because we hold an obligation to these elements. Our job isn't just to take care of children. And we know this. We know the layers of work that we do. It's so much bigger. And the more we recognize that, the more of a difference we can make. And so with that said, a children's rights-based approach is not always easier. It takes more steps and more real intentional work to uphold these rights. It takes more effort to implement. But that being said, we are obligated as a country and as a profession to uphold children's rights. When Canada signed the UNCRC, we as early childhood educators in Canada also agreed to uphold these rights. And so Jewel is gonna talk about some of the areas that are specific to what we as early child educators do and how rights relate to our everyday practice. So uh, as we introduce the UNCRC, and a child rights based approach. Although we as educators have a role in supporting and upholding all children's rights, today we want to look more closely at perhaps the specific areas of children's rights that can pertain to us as educators in the ECE field. 
Of course, this isn't in all of them, and for the sake of time, we can't dive into each of these components um, as it pertains to a rights-based approach. We will, however, dive into one or two specifics a little bit later on in the presentation, but to get us started, we've kind of broken it down into seven categories. So rights pertaining to the EC field look at how we as educators view play and promote opportunities, how we design environments that support the rights of children, you know, examples how we create space to be heard. Uh, it's about the curriculum and how we embed these provisions within the UNCRC, within our curriculum and within our program planning. It's about health and nutrition and how we support and educate children as well as their families so that it isn't just happening in centers, but it's also happening at home and how we reshape our own view of what all forms of rest look like for children. So these are just a few ideas to touch on today, but before we kind of go into a little bit more detail, Emmy and I want to highlight that this slide is going to demonstrate a little bit of language that we both use that relates to this working model that we've adapted from Laura Lundy's work, if anyone's familiar with her. But this is a really important relationship that really emphasizes the rights of children. On the model, we can see that there's two labeled roles. There's the rights holders, which is on the bottom, and there's the duty bearers, which is on the top. So this is a constant moving working model that demonstrates children's rights involve two interactive components. The duty bearers, that's us, that's whoever um, is an educator who works with children. We carry an obligation and an accountability under the UNCRC to uphold and bring these rights to fruition. So the rights holders, the children in our care, they actively participate by asserting their rights from us, the duty bearers, this constant moving cycle. Parents and others involved in the care of children also assume the role of duty bearers, each with specific responsibilities towards children. And the government serves as the primary duty bearer, holding obligations to respect, to protect and fulfill people's rights. While we may not have direct authority over this, we can advocate for and prioritize this perspective. So with each article in the UNCRC, all educators or staff in the field that work with children and youth must comprehend how this relationship operates at various levels within the specific context of your work environment and your job. So if we use the language duty bears, this working model is kind of where it's coming from. So what is our role as adults? <clears throat> There is kind of four pieces that we've broken it down to that all pertain into the actualization of children's rights. Decisions, outcomes, and consequences. Educators should incorporate discussions about rights and responsibilities into their curriculum and into their program planning with children. By teaching children about their rights, we're empowering them to make informed decisions and to understand the potential outcomes and consequences of all their actions. Through scenarios, through case studies and real life examples, educators can help children comprehend how their choices impact the rights and the rights of others. Another way that we have a role is to teach, to model, and to listen, and to uphold. Educators should not only teach about children's rights, but we also need to model respectful and inclusive behavior in our interactions with children. So by actively listening to students, perspectives, and experiences, educators can create a supportive environment where children feel empowered, and we all want them to feel empowered. We all want them to feel like they have a, a voice and that their opinions matters that their opinions and their concerns matter. So upholding children's rights also means addressing any instances of discrimination, any bullying or violations of rights within the ECE environment or community promptly and effectively to ensure that everyone is aware. Um, another role that we have is it's like Emmy said, it's a little bit extra daily effort. So beyond the standard curriculum, beyond our role as an EC, which we already know that being an EC is not just one simple little bubble and it pertains to so many other things and our role is so important, but it does take a little bit of extra effort to integrate activities and to integrate discussion that promotes the awareness of a children's right or children's rights into our practice and into daily classroom routines. So this could include dedi dedicating, you know, specific class time to explore different articles, perhaps within the UNCRC or organizing events or projects that focus on children's rights and children's rights issues. Um, and it also involves encouraging children to take action in their communicate communities to advocate for the rights of other mm -hmm. children. 
And so a huge job of as a Oh, I'm stuttering on my words. Sorry, pardon me. I just finished a long work day. A huge role for us as educators is to understand that it does take more work, but the more that we respect children and the more that we understand children, we become an adult ally and duty bearer. And that is the exact relationship I was talking about before. As long as we keep giving children their rights and listening to them in this dynamic relationship that I mentioned here keeps on flowing, we are upholding our job as educators in the field. Awesome, thanks, Joel. Um, so we also talked a little bit about earlier uh, children's agency. And so as rights holders, children also have agency, this topic of agency. Some of you might have heard about it, um, talk about it in your staff meetings, things like that. But in order to take children's voices and participation seriously, we have to come from a viewpoint that children do have their own agency and there are many ways that we can support that but first let's kind of talk about its definition and so children's agency is defined as being able to make choices and decisions to influence events and to have an impact on one's world or lived experience supporting children's agency is about recognizing that children have a right to make choices and decisions and are capable of initiating their own learning. And so as educators, when considering how the program involves children in decision-making or allows children to have and practice that agency, we have to ask ourselves and reflect on some of these questions here in the slide. You know, what is an appropriate level of autonomy or agency for children to have in the age range that I work in, right? Because that's gonna look different from somebody who's in an infants and toddlers room versus a school age program. And so it's kind of up to us to see how we consider that. We also wanna think about how are children involved in program decision-making? How do they contribute to the environment? Children are the ones spending a lot of their time in this environment. How can they make decisions about it? We also wanna consider what responsibilities do the children have and how would this contribute to their sense of agency or to empower them? And then another important piece is asking children about feedback as well. So when children do express themselves, when they share a decision or an idea, how will we let the children know that they've been heard? How does that feedback process um, inform those decisions? And then we wanna also talk about how children's interests are pursued and celebrated within the classroom or the environment. And if the physical environment or the program allows for educators and children to chat about ideas. What's that power dynamic look like? So these are all parts of a children's rights-based approach. And a child's sense of agency and autonomy, despite what age or developmental stage they're at, it's a key concept to a child's overall development. Um, so it's very critical to consider. Another kind of linked topic towards children's agency is this idea of tokenism. And so the idea of agency also helps us move away from just hearing the children's voices and leaving it at that, right? That's tokenistic. That's an example of tokenism. Participation for show where children have little or no real influence, right? Their voices don't make a real difference. Um, the participation truly stops at hearing. That's tokenism. Moving away from tokenism towards meaningful participation involves letting children give their opinion and contribute to decisions that focus on issues that are relevant to their lives in a real way, a way that makes change. And so that being said, it, it is important to highlight what participation is and what it isn't in an early learning setting. And so it's such an important part of children's rights, this piece about participation. Um, and so it's important to talk about as well. So what it isn't, as we mentioned, it's not about handing over the power to children. That's not meaningful participation. It's also not believing that children are the only experts in their own lives. There's an adult obligation, as Jewel had mentioned, as duty bearers, to also consider children's best interests. And it's certainly not allowing children to do things that are harmful or unsafe or that would violate their other rights or the other rights of children. What is participation then? 
participation is an ongoing process based on mutual respect. And so children have rights and so do educators, right? And so modeling that mutual respect is a key part of participation. It acknowledges children's status as rights holders and it confirms that they are citizens of today rather than beings in becoming. What they say and think today, it matters despite their age. It also holds the notion that children have expertise in their own lives. Who better to talk about the experience of what it is to be a child or you know, what I wanna play with than a child themselves? And it is that active decision-making piece, right? So participation is a critical part of the UNCRC and it appears in many articles. And so it's a really a key provision within that whole idea of a, of a children's rights-based approach to practice. Awesome, thanks Emmy. And kind of to go off that, um, as she, as Emmy was explaining, it's not just about listening, it's about hearing. And so, um, as part of that, listening is recognizing as one of the fundamental rights of children. So it's expressed in Articles 12 and Article 13 of the United Nations Convention. And when we look at all the ways of listening, it kind of can be broken down into four sections. The first one, listening creatively. This is, can adults appreciate children's languages? The second one is listening patiently. Can adults actually appreciate the significance of time? The next one is listening in the here and the now. Can adults attend to context? And the last one is children's insights about children's rights. What do they already know? So arguably, without this listening piece, us as duty bearers, we cannot integrate the rights holders. So it's really key. If we're not listening on every single level possible and we're not hearing, we're not actually doing our job. So a great quote by Alderson says, it does not depend on the age of the teller, but on the sensitivity of the listener. And I know that this really resonates with Emmy and I because it's really re relevant in adult lives and it's really relevant in working with children. So in relation to the ways of listening, we can take a quick look at um, respecting children's views in ways where we actively listen. So um, on the slide here, it looks at active listening and cultural sensitivity, but ways that we actively listen, look at nonverbal cues, which we all probably know all of these, but it's just a general overview. Nonverbal cues, this is the use of our body language to convey attentiveness. We can demonstrate it, like we said, as part of upholding children's rights. It's also demonstrating the rights that we have is our body language showing that we're not really paying attention when a child's speaking or are we really, you know, eye contact? Are we down on their level? Are we face to face with them? It's looking at reflective responses. Um, that's us repeating what the child said to confirm our understanding. That's making them feel validated and heard. It's also paraphrasing um, their the children's words into our own words. Another way that we really show them that we're taking the time to hear what they've said to us and then it's asking clarifying questions to seeking additional to seek additional information for better comprehension another way that we're really showing children we're hearing them we're not just listening and again it's a lot easier said than done sometimes it takes some extra time especially you know emmy and i both know what it's like to work in a center and have lots of children lots of kids talking everyone needing something for, from you and so it can't always be done but we're just saying you know take the time try and be a little bit more um try and show a little bit more that you're hearing them not just listening and so we're going to take a look at two practical examples kind of like what we said at the beginning just for the sake of time but we decided to talk about two areas that are especially relevant in a typical day in an early learning center so the first we're going to look at is play and the second we're going to look at is participation and how these both apply to a children's rights-based approach um, in both of these two areas awesome so um, as Jewel had mentioned, play and participation, huge parts of a children's rights based approach and a huge part to our kind of daily um, experiences as early childhood educators. Arguably, one of the most important pieces of early childhood education is is play. Um, it can mean a lot of different things and come in a lot of different forms. But today we will consider it from the view of the rights of children. 
And so Article 31 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child specifically recognizes and highlights the right of a child to rest and leisure, to engage in play and recreational activities that are appropriate to the age of the child and to participate freely in cultural life and arts. So the right to play is explicitly outlined in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The General Committee on the UNCRC defines play as behavior that is initiated, controlled, and structured by children. It's non-compulsory, driven by intrinsic motivation, and it's not a means to an end. And it has emphasized that it has should have key characteristics of fun, of course, uncertainty, challenge, flexibility, and non-productivity. And so I think it's great that the UNCRC defines play, right? Because it's kind of breaking it down. It's free, it's structured by the children, um, and it's not kind of product oriented, right? It's the process of play. And so in alignment with the children's rights-based approach, we wanna consider how we integrate play into our daily environments. And again, it, it is the entire day of a lot of programs. So it's important to consider. So most importantly, we want to encourage and facilitate child-led play, open-ended play experiences, and allow children to take the lead in their play experiences. Providing open-ended materials and opportunities for imaginative, self-directed play and allowing children to explore their interests and exercise their right to play. And a lot of you probably already do that, free play, open-ended materials. And so that's great. You'll know that you've already kind of integrated a piece of a children's rights-based approach and highlighted how important it is to continue doing that. Play is also the environment in which play um, occurs is also important. It can and it should happen in many places. The main places children play um, are at home, are at school or at their center, within the community, and of course, in the outdoors as well. Play at home applies to us as educators and duty bearers as well. Though we're not in the homes of children, we can focus on spreading the message of the importance of play to families, because children, of course, play at home too. And we wanna encourage parents to allow for free play. A lot of children are in structured activities and that's great, but there does need to be an emphasis on that importance of free play and what comes from that creativity um, and expression of their rights. The elements of time, space, and materials make it possible for children to explore, to invent, and to make their ideas visible. So time, time, schedule, um, amount of time we dedicate to play, it's, it's a huge consideration. And it's huge when it comes to rights. Children do not have um, a scheduled time to play, right? This is their right. There cannot be a time stamp on play and play does not have to be earned. As educators or practitioners who work with children, it's important to notice, to be able to notice a moment of play, child-led kind of organic play and be okay with taking a step back and putting our daily schedule second to that play. And again, that can be challenging, but the first step is kind of being aware of those moments that they exist and that it was is within a child's right to continue that play uninterrupted to a degree. Space is also huge. Um, again, whether this is indoor play or outdoor play, if children are not giving adequate spaces, well lit, um, if it's indoors and winter, it's warm, or there's ample outdoor space to explore, their play and their play outcomes will ultimately be hindered. And so this is also embedded in the play-based rights of children. Children are often more capable of playing than we as adults or educators give them credit for. And they find time and space to play wherever and whenever the conditions allow. However, children will struggle to play when their basic needs are not met or when the environments they live within are so constraining that they're unable to play. And so environment is a huge piece of this too, space, considering those things. And then materials is another really important piece as well. What do children need to make their play possibilities, their interests possible? This is from their own perspective. And so it's important to sit down and ask them, you know, 
what should we order this week when we're doing our materials or our craft order? Um, what are some things you need to make your play experiences come to life? Asking them to, to be involved in how those materials are sourced and not assuming we know what children want to play with, right? We're going to ask them what they want to play with. That's a simple step in a children's rights-based approach. The main thing that Jewel and I want to highlight when it comes to a children's rights-based ap approach and play is to avoid using play as a reward or an initiative. And sometimes these just come naturally to us as educators because play is such a you know, important part of children's lives, it really encourages them. So we want to avoid saying things like, you know, when we're, when we're all sitting nicely, then we can go play. You've all been so well behaved today that you deserve extra play time. After you clean up, then we can play, right? So that's moving away from a rights-based approach. Play is a right that's given to children from the moment they're born. They do not have to earn it. And they should not think that they have to earn it. So that's a big shift in considering play in the early learning setting. Thanks, Emmy. So um, another one we're gonna look at, like we mentioned was participation. So participation is outlined in many articles within the UNCRC, and we touched on it a bit in the webinar so far, but meaningful participation involves a feedback loop. So if children's voices were not involved in the outcome, children are told why, which means they're informed of the results of their um, actions. So this means, um, you know, in a collaborative environment, like we said, a rights-based approach does not mean allowing every child to get and to do what they want. That's not what we're talking about, but it means having this relationship and this feedback loop that's able to communicate, you know, why we're not going with their idea or why something might not be happening that they had wanted. And remembering that it's okay to not use each and every, every idea, but just taking the time to consider what it means to show them that they feel valued and that their voices were heard and that their ideas were heard. So a couple things that this might look like is classroom meetings with agendas. So many of you likely do this with the children in your care, but hold regular classroom meetings with a predetermined agenda to discuss topics relevant to you know, children's experiences and concerns, and then invite children to suggest agenda items and facilitate discussions on issues, you know, maybe such as classroom rules or upcoming events or ideas for improving their own learning environment. Have children take turns even leading the meeting or supporting you in leading the meeting. And I know sometimes it's hard to initially think that, you know, a two or three year old could support this idea, but they definitely can. And so it's it's figuring out what works for you, what works for your center and what works for the children in your center to try and include this. So I'm sure that many of you have this embedded in your practice, but interest based centers is setting up, you know, interest based centers within the classroom where children can choose which activity they want to do based on their preferences. So example, you know, a dedicated art zone, a dedicated building zone, dramatic play, sensory exploration, um, encourage children to select what, cent what centers that they want to do each day, allowing them to actively participate in their own learning experiences. Again, I'm sure that many of you are already doing this. So that's wonderful. And then project based learning. So this is definitely something that is um, very Reggio Emilia and it's definitely getting taken into a lot of other centers and different dynamics of program plans, but project based learning allows the engagement um, of children to focus on one project for long term. So it the project will align with children's interests and inquiries, which will allow them to choose the topics that they want to investigate. It allows them to ask questions and explore solutions collaboratively with one another and um, with the educators. And it encourages children to document their learnings through drawing, through photos, um, written verbal reflections, empowering them to be an active role in shaping their learning journey. So allow children to leave these projects and revisit and participate with it as they see fit. This is another big piece. And I know that this can be quite challenging as an educator to allow an area of the room to not be cleaned up. Um, but, you know, giving them that space to to work and to do that and participate as they see fit. 
Another way you can allow participation is to assign classroom jobs to different children, such as line leader, snack helper, uh, book organizer, and rotating these roles regularly to give children a chance to, chance to participate um, and to contribute to the smooth running system of the classroom. And also allow children to give input on jobs that they'd like to take on and job ideas. And I know it's funny, but I'm sure we've all experienced it. Sometimes they just have the most creative ideas of a job you you would never think of, like a child wants to have the job and rotate every day of just turning the light on to the classroom in the morning or something. So giving them that ability to participate in the classroom. And then this involves believing just in children's capacity to participate in the larger community as well. So initiate community, community involvement projects where children can actively participate in making a positive impact in the local community. You know, this could look like organize a litter cleanup day at a nearby park or collaborate with a local charity to collect donations from families. Um, involve children in planning, organizing, and executing these projects, which empowers them to contribute to the community that they live in or go to or where their center is. So this also means that you need to embrace spontaneous moments of curiosity and exploration by allowing children to lead their own learning experiences. Again, I'm sure that almost every single one of you are already doing that, but we want to encourage children to continue to be curious, to want to discover. And this really coexists with this idea that educators are co-learners, co-imaginers, co-researchers. Um, this is all really part of the flight curriculum, if anyone is familiar with that. But uh, it's OK to want to learn with them and do things with them. That really makes them feel like they are really a participant of the classroom. And so that was kind of just a little two blurb thing on two articles within the provision. But what's next and what does this all mean and where do we go from here and how do we add um, a child rights based approach to our toolkits moving forward? So the first thing that Emmy and I hope uh, you leave here today with is that you just have a passion to continue to learn a little bit more about the UNCRC or what a child's rights based approach to practice really means as it pertains to yourself and your center and the children in your center. And we want you to continue to learn yourself, but also educate the children in your care, the families in your care. It's OK. You don't have to be a master and know all of this in order to teach others. It's OK to learn with everyone else in your center, with the families in your center and do it together. So this can be done through workshops um, like you guys all came today, which is wonderful. Um, but continue to expand the research on your own and um, located on the right here, this white box. This is a resource that we will be providing you with that has tons of links and information to different resources that will support your your learning and your further professional development. But um, another great resource that can help better your knowledge is using a checklist. Um, there's there's tons of different things. There's this one on the left here. This is the it's a child friendly version of the UNCRC, but it actually comes from a website called Dual Frequency, Dual Frequency, and they have full posters. They have individual posters with really simple language that can be used in your center at the front door bulletin with children directly. But um, for the sake of time, I won't continue going on with a couple other examples, but uh, please do take a look at the research um, resource that we send you. Another great way and thing that you can do, and I'm sure lots of you are already doing it, is to provide newsletters to families and update them on what maybe you're doing in the classroom that pertains to children's rights and teaching children about the UNCRC and keeping them up to date so that the language that's being used in the center can also be used at home. Um, I'll let Emmy dive in here. Great, yeah. So from here, as Jewel had just kind of talked about there, that education base, so searching for more professional development, getting a hold on some of the language of the of the provisions within the UNCRC. Once you have a little bit more knowledge, you can then focus on a rights-based curriculum and integrating this into your center. And so designing curriculum activities that explicitly teach children about their rights within the UNCRC. So incorporating stories, role playing or modeling um, and discussions around you know the right to education the right to play the right to be protected from harm 
right? So there's lots of stories and videos that can help with this. There's some that are outlined in that resource um, sheet we'll, we'll provide to you as well. Um, we also just wanna highlight again, and Jewel touched on this, but child-led projects within the classroom, you know, allowing them to kind of take a little bit more autonomy and agency within that classroom and what you're learning about, right? Learning is so much more impactful, engaging and rights-based when it's based upon children's interests. And again, just having that idea of child-friendly spaces, um, you know, that's a great place to start, right? Have children give input on the setup and the design of the environment in which they're learning in. Also considering the documentation of children's voices and their work. So use documentation techniques like photographs um, and hanging children's artwork to capture and showcase the children's um, experiences and perspectives as well. So consider uh, documentation, te documentation techniques like learning stories, um, floor books, right? Kind of like that lived scrapbook where children can revisit it at any point during the day and add their own takeaways or their own learning experiences, right? That's, that's what we're there for, to see what they're learning, what they're interested in. So let them be involved in that documentation piece as well, right? And then through documentation, like in that sense as well, you can mirror things like consent giving, right? Is it okay if I take a picture of you playing? Um, no or yes, that's a child's right. So there's opportunities within the classroom to embed this curriculum that now we hope that between the education that you received this evening and the resources you can interact with later, you'll feel comfortable to integrate some of these um, pieces within your curriculum. And kind of the larger, more difficult piece of a rights-based approach is advocacy, advocating for policy change. And a lot of us as ECEs are also very much advocates, advocates for the profession, for the field, for, you know, positive development for children. And so I, I feel as though ECEs are natural advocates, but when it comes to rights, we can add kind of another thing that we need to advocate for. And depending on your role, it is important to regularly review policies and procedures to ensure that they're consistent with the principles of the UNCRC and reflect current best practices in ECE um, research, things like that and make revisions to better support children's rights at a program level. And finally, to advocate for policy change. So advocate at the local, regional, and national levels that promote and protect children's rights in all areas of their lives, including education, healthcare, social services, get involved in advocacy campaigns and collaborate with other stakeholders to make positive change. Write to government leaders on childcare issues that you're passionate about. All of this aligns with the children's rights-based approach to practice. This is a part of our role too. We need to get involved at many levels. Um, and as Jewel had mentioned, a start could be the parents, letting the parents know what this is, letting them know the language, things like that. All of that falls within this advocacy umbrella. Do we have time for this, Emmy, or no? I think we do, Joel. Yeah, okay. So um, this is something just for Emmy and I that we'd love to kind of hear maybe uh, from you one key takeaway from our presentation, maybe something that was new to you or something that you want to share with others, something that was different than what you're already doing or something mm -hmm. that sparked interest that you want to research a little bit more. Um, feel free to use the chat box. You can do one word, write a little sentence. Um, we just would love to hear kind of if anything spoke to you or was new to you um, before we leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll give you a moment there in the chat box and see what kind of comes through. I know it was a lot of information because we only had a short amount of time and we, wanna, we wanted to give a bunch of information, but mm -hmm. hopefully we didn't overwhelm you if you were not familiar with a few things to start with. Yeah, so lots of great things in the chat, right? Um, learning that there's so many rights that children have. Absolutely. Uh, play shouldn't be a reward. Um, some people are talking about that flight curriculum, and I do realize this is kind of Canadian wide. So that is a particularly a Alberta curriculum we use for early childhood education. Very interesting and probably relevant to a lot of um, people in Ontario or various BC, various places. 
um, importance of play, the importance of authentic participation. Absolutely. Great info. The posters, that's great. Um, and that's something like Jewel had mentioned, you, you know, everyone can kind of go to their center and do that tomorrow if they're so inclined. So, yeah. Um, I'm just summarizing some of these, Jewel, because I'm not sure if you can see the yeah, chat. My chat box is muted, so I, I can't okay. say anything. No problem. I no one was typing, but I'm glad that lots yeah. of people are. <laughs> lots of people are coming in. Um, I like this. Learn that there are many like-minded ECEs in Calgary and Alberta who want to uphold, promote, and advocate for children's rights. Yes. And across Canada, for that matter. Wonderful. Tokenism. Don't use play as a reward. Ask their needs before ordering things. Absolutely. And that from a young age, right? Um, getting more children involved in decisions about their play environment. Um, yeah, there's so much here. I'm just going to kind of read through. There's some repeat, repetitive ones, so I'm just kind of allowing children to lead their own learning experiences, um, not using play as a reward. Uh, the teacher should utilize the opportunity to learn from children. Absolutely. Make plans for the classroom, make jobs. Um, I like the idea of asking if I can take a picture of the kids while they're playing. Yeah. Play is a right. I love this. This is popping up time and time again, Joel. It's just, that's wonderful. Yeah, lots here. I'm just kind of scrolling through to see if I missed anything. Focus on listening. Yeah, that's that's absolutely something that we need to kind of focus in on as, as ECs. And something I think we need to remind ourselves of every day that we enter the center. Active listening. Um, posters, everybody's loving the posters. I'm excited about learning more. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. I don't think we have time to read all of these wonderful ones, but I'm just seeing if there's anything that stood out. Lighting the flame, yeah, it's kind of a good um, analogy. There's so much, this is wonderful. Yeah, great. So I'm gonna put in the chat and Robin has also advised that she's gonna send me this out in an email as well, but I'm just gonna put the PDF in the chat here as well. So if, I think I can, well, maybe I'm not yeah, able to actually. Oh no. Trying to drag it. Because if you can't, we can send that out in uh, the follow-up message too. We can include that. Okay. You know what? It might be too big, Robin, actually. So oh. you might have to link it in the uh, email that you send if that's okay. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Great. Because we're happy to send out, uh, we'll be sending out a, a follow-up email for everybody that participated, um, as well as a link to the live webinar so you can view it again or share it with your colleagues. And also the slide presentation that they've so generously provided for us to send out. And as well, we'll include some links in there and some any other um, additional information that, that, we can, that we can put in there so you guys can look at it after the event or share it with your colleagues. But please note that you'll get a PD certificate if you attended the live event. We can't give this certificates out if you're just watching the replay event but we're happy to give them out to all of you that participated so many of you from across the country we're so happy mm -hmm. to have you all join us tonight when I'm sure you've had a long day at work but uh, such an important topic and thank you so much Jewel and Emmy for for giving us this really this perspective that I think a lot of people in our field don't necessarily have and they don't know how to even start about start thinking about it and I think it gives us an an idea of how impactful our work is and certainly how we can all take this right space approach which is just so important to be doing in our practice each and every day so thanks so much for joining us everybody mm -hmm. and thank you so much for your great content and i look forward to putting it together to send that follow-up email because i know it'll be shared far and wide so thanks mm -hmm. again so much and i hope everyone has a great evening and i think as well mm -hmm. you'll get to see some of the chat um when we give you the transcript, uh, Jewel, because I know you missed some of that. So I'm hoping that I'll come through in the transcript. So hopefully we can share that with you and you can take a look at what people are saying. It's wonderful comments. So thanks again for people mm -hmm. uh, contributing their comments to that. We really appreciate that. Yeah, All right, thanks then. for having well, us. So long from Ottawa and thank you so much for joining <laughs> us tonight. Yes, bye, -bye. bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.